Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Church. My name is Eric, and Amy and I are going to lead you in worship today. How's everyone doing out there? All right. We're going to need you to sing loud and, and uh, with energy today, and welcome to everyone online. All right, Amy, lead us. All right. Would you please join? One, two, three. be seated. Amen. What a beautiful way to begin worship this morning. Hear now this reading from the Psalter. This is Psalm 46, and it might be familiar to you. It is filled with beautiful metaphor and imagery. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, 
the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations the Lord has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. And welcome to worship this morning at First Church in Crystal Lake. It is a day to rejoice and worship and praise God, whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are worshiping online.
to be here in your house this morning to be able to worship the creator of um, our earth, and we are just blessed to be able to praise your name. You're the only one name now and always. We pray right now that you will open our hearts and minds and prepare us to um, encounter you today through this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, Amy. Um, just want to say welcome to worship. If uh, you've got your children in here with you, this is the time that we are going to dismiss them to their class. So, uh, the, of course, they're more than welcome to stay if you like them here with you. But otherwise, sayonara. It was nice knowing you. Um, you all can have a seat. Um, while the kids are filing out, I just want to give you a couple of announcements, or we'll call them ministry highlights, things that are happening in the life of the church. Uh, the first is something we call navigating the now, and um, navigating the now is sort of like, uh, think about it as uh, monthly seminars that we are hosting to help you sort of navigate whatever life stage that you're currently in. So some of these will be really relevant to uh, whatever is going on in your life, and some of them you'll recognize, oh, that's for like other people, but there's one for me, you know, coming down the calendar. So this first one is uh, just managing screen time on social media uh, for children and youth. So if you don't have children and youth, then this, this one's probably not for you unless you just find yourself doom scrolling on Instagram. Maybe this would be uh, therapeutic for you. But uh, if, if that's something that's interesting to you, I highly recommend you check it out. We are not just going to sit around tables and spitball ideas. We're bringing in a professional who uh, presents on this issue all the time, so he is going to guide us through some discussion and some tips about uh, how to manage screen time for your kids. And as a church, we feel like we are doing our best to help. You can see that we are down to one screen, and this is how we are helping you manage your screen time, by just taking away a screen. I'm just kidding, it's broken, so I don't know when that gets fixed, but anyway, uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is our trunk or treat is coming up. If you've got kids, uh, we invite you to come and uh, walk the path of trunks and play the games and prizes and get the treats. We love to have the kids out and everybody in their costumes. That's a lot of fun. Um, but if the, the real fun, you might not realize this, the real fun is hosting a trunk, uh, decorating, decorating it and filling it with candy and games and prizes and welcoming all the the families from the community. This is one of our uh, biggest community events of the, the year, and it's a great experience. Michelle and I always run the popcorn booth. That's kind of our thing, and I love it. I love seeing all the families and guessing, you know, what crazy TV show the costumes are from. Um, it's a really a lot of fun. So if that's something that is interesting to you, you can sign up online, or uh, you can talk to Karen Klaus. She'll get you set up as a trunk host. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is family worship, which uh, family Sunday or worship service, uh, it, the way it works is any, sun, or any month that has five Sundays on the first Sunday of that month, we're going to have worship services that include the entire family, kids, parents, grandparents, everybody, and uh, just that's only four times a year, so it's not super disruptive to what we normally do. The reason we're doing that is because we, we realize that a, a child can come to First Church on the first day that they, ever, that they ever show up, they can be in our preschool, they can go through kids first, they can go through youth group and Sunday school and all that, and never attend a worship service. Never learn what it means to worship with the community of all the believers, never experience communion the way that we do, and so just a few times a year, we want to invite everybody so that this is a great family experience. So. Uh, the first one is coming up October 1st in just a couple of weeks. Just giving you a heads up, that's what's happening on October 1st. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is first things first. The, um, the date of that is October 8th, and <laughs> it magically got fixed, I guess. But uh, yeah, October 8th is when that's coming up, and what uh, first things first is, is just a chance for us to introduce ourselves to you. If, if you're new or you've been around the church for a while and haven't met the staff, haven't uh, learned a little bit about how we communicate, the things that are important to us, ways to get involved. It's just like a one-hour uh, free lunch, meet the pastor, all, that's, all that good stuff. So if you're kind of new around here, that might be something you want to check out if you want to get to know us 
better. Uh, so, with all that said, I'm going to hand things back over to Amy and the band. They're going to lead us in a song. And this one is, I mean, you can sing along if you want, but this one is really just a way to help us focus on uh, today's worship and the theme of today. So, All right, this is a new song, and Amy is going to lead it. <laughs> This broken world is breaking me down. When my tears and knees both fall to the ground. When my questions make me doubt you more than ever. You remind me that you're beautiful song. Uh, earlier this week, Amy sent me this song. She said, how about if we do this one? And I said, okay, before I even listened to it. And I'm glad that that worked out because that, uh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Amy and the band. Um, <clears throat> Pastor Lisa is on vacation uh, for the next two weeks. And so if you could remember her in your prayers um, just for safe travels and that she returns to us revived and just... Uh, excited about the mission and ministry of First Church. I have no doubt this will be a good uh, time for her to be away. We're starting a new teaching series today called Facebook Theology. You can see it on the screen. It's on the front of your bulletin. And before we decided on the title, Facebook Theology, we thought about calling it, The Bible Doesn't Say That. But 
in the end, we felt like that sounded a little pedantic, uh, like we're going around sniping everybody's ideas about God. Eh, that's not what the Bible says. And so we decided, we'll, we'll just call this Facebook theology, and let me explain what that means. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes, and especially during crisis, there are these really complicated issues and questions about faith, and they sort of get boiled down into these pithy, repeatable, sort of half-true uh, statements that sound like something the Bible says. And so we're, we're just sort of going after them. And uh, a lot of this stuff existed long before Facebook was even around. So if you think, oh, this is a, this is a younger generation thing because I never had a Facebook, uh-uh, this is on you too. Because this, if you guys ever been to a Christian bookstore? This would have been like those calendars, you know, like, cal like verse of the day calendar or like inspiration of the day, uh, paper towels or, you know, you know whatever. It's the stuff that maybe you have or had in your house. Um, before, it used to be some of these, what I would call Facebook theology, didn't get a lot of traction. It would just sort of die out in, uh, you know, at the end of Aunt Sally's prayer brunch. But now with social media, ideas that are unchallenged by scrutiny or tradition, they're allowed to just spread and get shared everywhere. And so in this sermon series, we're taking a look at four that are uh, well-known or well-worn Christian catchphrases, and we're sort of uncovering the truth behind them and what we should really be thinking about them and uh, what they reveal about God and ourselves. <clears throat> so the first bit of Facebook theology we're going to tackle this morning is God won't give you more than you can handle. I am sure you have seen this before. I am sure you've read it before. I am sure that some of you, somebody here today probably has it up on their wall in their house, like as an encouragement. And this, this is what we're going to talk about this morning. God won't give you more than you can handle. I've heard it in small groups. I've heard it in hospital waiting rooms. I've heard it spoken around campfires. I've heard it in Sunday school. I've heard it in prayer meetings. I've heard it in bars and restaurants. I've heard it over the phone. I've heard it shared between uh, friends, strangers, family, all varieties of people of faith and people just vocalizing a faith that they don't practice. It's everywhere. This is one of the most repeated catchphrases of Christianity. It is a universal phrase. It's been around long before Facebook, but I believe it is sort of the epitome of the kind of thing that I would call Facebook theology. Ideas that thrive on social media platforms, theology that sounds about right, is maybe even inspired by scripture, but is at best inaccurate and worst harmful. So I hope by the end of our time today, we're gonna replace this cliche with a better promise from God. Something that is both true and helpful. So I'll break it down this way. I'm not going to point all these out as we go, but this is, this is the basic outline of what we're doing today. We're going to talk about how this statement is biblically inaccurate. We're going to talk about how it paints a troubling picture of God. And we're going to talk about how this phrase might actually prevent us from asking for the help that we actually need. Okay, so here we go. Um, some of you today are thinking, Hmm, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. That is in the Bible. I have read that before. I swear I just saw it a few weeks ago. I even said it to myself last time I had to choke down grandma's dinner. Well, it's not in the Bible. Not exactly. It's sort of from the Bible. So we're going to look at some scripture uh, today where um, this phrase is inspired from. And um, we'll just... We'll break it down that way. So you can follow along. The text is going to be on the screen. Uh, there's Bibles in the pew in front, like in the back of the pew in front of you, or you can look it up on your phone. The reference is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 through 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 through 14. And before we get into this, I want to give you just a few background notes about 1 Corinthians. Okay? So this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the city of Corinth in the first century, uh, it's the first century A.D. 
Now, Corinth is still, it's a port city in Greece. It's very large, and uh, the, the church that he's writing to, the people of the Corinthian church, they are brand new converts to the faith. And the church is very new, and it is in the center of a very metropolitan and very pagan city. There was a popular phrase at this time that said, to live as a Corinthian, which was synonymous for saying to live with drunkenness and promiscuity. So in other words, the people of this church, brand new church, brand new Christians, they are struggling because they are leaving a life of sin and they're trying to figure out how all this works. And they're struggling because they, they were just recently living a life that they are now finding out is not God's way. And so if you look, if you read just the tone of the book of 1 Corinthians and the topics that Paul covers, you get the impression that if it could be going wrong, it was going wrong. Things are not all right at the church in Corinth. So we're taking a look at the portion of this letter. Paul writes, Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did, and were killed by destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So what's he talking about? Who are these people that got bit by snakes and were grumbling? Who is he referring to? Paul is drawing a parallel between the struggling believers of this brand new church and the Israelites coming out of Egypt during the time of Moses. So like 1,500 years before Paul writes this to the church in Corinth, he's talking about the Israelites. He wants them to know that they are not unique in their struggle, that in fact, the earliest remnants of God's people also wrestled with sexual immorality, with idolatry, as they were learning to follow God. People, people coming out of Egypt, they didn't know God, they didn't have the law of Moses, they didn't know how to follow God, and so Paul is saying, hey, they figured it out. You can do this too. And so to encourage them further, Paul continues. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. There's, there's our verse. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So Paul's intent here is to tell these struggling Christians that their temptation is normal. They come from a long line of people who struggle with temptation. He's telling them God will not allow you to be overcome by, their, by your temptation to turn back to pagan gods, to animal sacrifices, or to engage in temple prostitution. God will provide a way out for you, an escape route, a way to resist temptation. This passage is not about God declining to overwhelm you with the burdens of life. It is about God helping specifically with temptation. So maybe that seems like case closed, right? You go, okay, great. So this phrase that I've heard a billion times, maybe I've even said it myself, God won't give you more than you can handle, that's not even biblical, so let's just toss it out. Um, we're done. Let's go home. The problem is that ideas about God don't have to have like this corresponding accurate scripture in order for them to thrive. We, we can't disarm this sentiment simply by pointing to a scriptural inaccuracy. This is an idea that people feel to be true. As much as they believe it is a promise from the Bible. And so we're going we're gonna to go even deeper with this. So I mentioned this catchphrase everywhere, and um, a couple weeks ago, um, I started reading the autobiography of Matthew Perry. You all know who that is, right? Matthew Perry played Chandler Bing in the TV show Friends. 
If you're not familiar, it's a sitcom from the 90s. Very popular. It's great. You should check it out. I'm a big fan. Anyway, he wrote in his autobiography um, and about his struggles with drugs and alcohol, and you kind of always knew that, you knew that part of his story, but it, this book is a little bit of a tell-all. Like he's finally pulled back the curtain and saying, here's what was really going on in my life. And I'm very interested in this because I'm a fan of the show. Michelle got this book for Christmas, and I've been kind of eyeing it for a couple months. Like, if you're not reading that, I'm going to read it. And so uh, this is not a part of research or anything. This is just fun read for me, you know, just like killing time. Uh, so I'm not 20 pages into this book, and there's our little catchphrase right there winking me in the face. Matthew Perry writes, I have been told that when someone is really sick, a kind of disconnect happens. A God only gives you what you can handle kind of thing kicks in. Now, Matthew Perry, in his book, he's not writing about faith. He's not writing about God. It's not a spiritual journey, at least not so far as I can tell. This is just a throwaway line about him being in so much pain from years of destroying his body with drugs and alcohol that he literally went into a coma. This idea is so embedded in our culture and into our understanding of the way the world works and the very nature of God that it being biblically inaccurate, it doesn't matter to anybody. They don't, they don't care. They're going to use this because this, this is just a part of us. So I'm going to... I'm going to break this open just a little bit more, and I want us to eliminate this from our theological repertoire. First of all, I can prove to you that it is not true right here and now simply by showing you a photo of what it looks like to have more in life than you can handle. And this is tough to look at, so you might shield your eyes, but here it is. This is Murphy, and he is only 3.25 pounds, and he is Michelle and I's dog. He's a four-and-a-half-old month, four-and-a-half-month-old puppy. We just got him in July, and he is 1,000% more than we can handle. <laughs> There's your proof. It may seem like I'm joking, but I'm not. We are in trouble. We need help. <laughs> so, okay, jokes aside, let's look at this phrase. God won't give you. I believe that we should tread carefully when we are toying with the idea of God giving us bad things or willing bad things to happen to us. Now, there is theology out there that suggests that God ordains everything that happens, good and bad, that, that life only works as an extension of his divine will. And that includes disaster, sickness, poverty, abuse, war, and on and on. So if life is terrible, it is because that's how God wants it to be. Since God has dominion over everything, nothing happens outside of his will. And that means everything from genocide to tsunamis are given to us by God. That is theology that I cannot accept. That is something I cannot believe. And I think that that paints a worrying picture of God, but that is what we are adopting when we suggest God won't give you more than you can handle. On the one hand, it, it sounds sort of benevolent, but on a closer examine, I, I question that theology. I ask this question, why, why is God piling all this up on me anyway? Or... Why is God, in this promise, not willing, me, not willing to hurl me off the cliff, but is willing to walk me right up to the edge? That, to me, is bizarre theology. Certainly, some suffering is caused as a direct consequence of living apart from God. And in the Bible, in the scriptures, uh, we do see caused suffering as a punishment for wickedness, but I think the, su the suffering that you and I experience, either for ourselves or for others, it comes from a variety of sources, um, such as a direct consequence for a choice that we've made. Sometimes suffering comes from just, we live in a sinful world among sinful people. 
but we ourselves are sinful. Some, sometimes I think suffering is random and it is senseless, and that is the hardest to make sense of. And sometimes we can be persecuted for the sake of Christ, though not very often in our culture. But to suggest that God is the source of suffering and calamity and chaos is something I cannot believe. God being the source of suffering and tragedy goes against my understanding of the nature of God. For example, uh, John wrote in 1 John chapter 1 uh, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Later in that same letter, John would write a phrase that we all know well, that God is love. James in his letter wrote, uh, God's good, uh, he wrote of God's goodness saying that God can't even be tempted to do evil, that God is the source of all goodness. Not only do I think that God is not the one giving me all the bad stuff, but I think even if we were to say that God at the very least won't let us become fully overcome by suffering, it sort of makes him kind of lousy. So imagine a parent came up with this strategy. I will let any and all harm come to my child, but I will draw the line at them being totally annihilated. That would be a pretty rotten parent. That would not be love. So when we're talking about pain in life, I have a problem with theology that says God is the giver of suffering. The author of Hebrews in the New Testament, he says that because Jesus himself was tested and suffered, he is able to help us. Now that is theology I can get behind. I think God's true role in our suffering is not one who wills it to happen, but one who can help us endure it, learn from it, and make good come out of it. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Peter wrote, uh, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's in 1 Peter. And from what Sherry read for us already this morning from Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The true benevolence of God is not that he won't let you be crushed, but that when you are crushed, he will be there to help you. It's not that God won't give you more than you can handle. It's that God will help you handle all that you've been given. So you've probably never heard of uh, this lady that's on the screen, Annie Johnson Flint. Uh, she, is, she was a Christian poet. And some of her writings uh, we have in hymnals, not our hymnal, but other hymnals. And uh, I want to tell you just a bit of her story. She was born on Christmas Eve in 1866. Um, by the time she turned age three, her mother passed away, and her father became so ill that he could not take care of her, and so he put her up for adoption. Before she finished high school, her loving adoptive parents passed away. So before she's even 18 years old, she lost two sets of parents. She always wanted to be a teacher, and so she started her career, and shortly after she began, she, um, because of a degenerative disease, became wheelchair-bound. She could not care for herself, so she lived the rest of her life in a sanitarium where other people could take care of her, and obviously she couldn't teach, and so she turned to writing poetry. A pretty tough life. But listen to the words of this poem entitled, He Giveth More Grace. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. God is not the one giving the suffering, and I hope we can agree on that. The idea that there is some upper limit of pain that he is sparing you from is as absurd as it is insulting. Absolutely, without a doubt, people suffer more than they can handle. 
be it from sickness or loss or depression or anxiety or life just being too terrible for too long, people get more than they can handle. And I think the biggest tragedy of God won't give you more than you can handle is that it leaves you feeling like it's up to you to endure, to white-knuckle your circumstances because God is holding up his end of the bargain. Uh, after the first service, uh, a woman came up to me and she said, when I lost my husband, somebody told me, well, God won't give you more than you can handle. She said, I felt like a failure. because it was more than I could handle. Some of you this morning, right here, right now, have more than you can handle. Maybe you've suffered loss. Maybe uh, you're disappointed in your career. Maybe your health is failing and you're overwhelmed by that. Or you've become a caretaker and it's really difficult. Maybe you feel trapped in your marriage or maybe you feel burdened by addiction or anxiety. Your attitude should not be, well, it could be worse. Your attitude should be, I need help. It is okay to not be okay. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by his friends and followers, Jesus confided in his own disciples. He said, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He asked for help. He asked for help. So don't fall into the trap of believing that God is withholding an end point of pain more than you can handle. I believe that God sustains us. I believe that God cares for us. I believe that he can help us through the tough times. But some of us are living right now with more than we can handle, beyond our capacity to cope. And I want to tell you, don't, don't buy into this theology. Seek help. Reach out to somebody. Talk to your family. Talk to a health professional. Talk to your pastors. Talk to your small group. And don't stop short of lifting your concerns to God in prayer. He cares for you and he is close to the brokenhearted. We need to trust in God, not as a pain gatekeeper, but as someone who helps us walk through life. God is like a friend who mourns with you. God is like a father who instructs and disciplines you. God is like a mother who defends and advocates for you. God is like a lover who is holds you close. God is like a brother who fights for you. God is like a sister who is like a best friend and always present with you. He giveth more grace as our burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as our labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. And you've got to wonder, why do people say this phrase anyway? How did this get to be so popular? Why is this sort of a default when it doesn't seem to be very good advice? And I admit, it does sound a little reassuring sort of on the first pass. Like there's some sort of built-in protection in life from being completely overwhelmed by sorrow or tragedy. But I think mostly we say this because we don't know what else to say. When our idea of God being good comes into sharp contrast with our experience of overwhelming loss or pain, it's a handy little slogan. Because when you're hurting or when you're disappointed or when you have far too much in life to balance or when you see a loved one going through that, you need something to hold on to. You need something to remind you that God is still good. But I'm telling you folks, this isn't it. This is not the phrase you're looking for. My hope is that we can agree to just purge this from the way that we understand God and how we relate to people who are struggling. God's promise is bigger and better than any phrase that fits on a bumper sticker. Remind yourself this in adversity. God loves you 
He can help you endure the pain and can even work it out for good. So let us be thoughtful in our understanding, compassionate in our caring for others. Would you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are our rock and our refuge. When life's challenges loom large and uncertainty surrounds us, we place our trust in your unwavering love and mercy. Help us hold fast to the assurance that you never leave our side, even in the darkest moments. When adversity tests our resolve, strengthen our hearts to rely on your guidance and provision. Fill us with the understanding that your purpose for us is filled with hope. In the moments of weakness, teach us to surrender our fears and anxieties to you. Help us to release the burdens we carry. Fill us with humility so that we are more willing to seek help. With your unending grace, lead us forward and grant us the courage to trust in your unfailing love. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Before we sing our last song, I just want to draw your attention to this morning's bulletin. You can see it is packed full of stuff. And there's things that we have we have going on that I just couldn't fit it all in here when I put this together this week. So that's not to say like you know, we have so many things happening. What what I what I want to say is we're able to have all of these opportunities available because of the generous giving that you all do to First Church. And uh, I'm just so grateful that we have, a, uh, we have a mission that is worth living for. We have ministries that are worth being a part of, and we're able to participate in that because of your generous giving. So thank you so much for whatever you're able to give. We don't pass plates or anything like that in service, but if you're interested in, in giving, um, you can do that online. There's a the box out in the hallway here if, if you've brought a check or whatever if you want to donate to the church. We certainly appreciate anything that you are able to give. Um, And now I will invite you to stand. We're going to sing together um, our closing song. And the words will be on the screen.
Friends, as you leave here today, may your trust in God be an unshakable foundation guiding you through life's challenges with unwavering faith. In this trust, may you find peace and purpose and boundless grace of his love. Amen.